on World News Tonight. Political uproar. Former PM Khan supporters defiant amid fears of renewed confrontations with security forces. Flooding disaster. Deadly floodings with Turkey still recovering from earthquakes. A potential peacemaker? Can China broker peace between Russia and Ukraine? Find out tonight. Pet chauffeur. Pet owners give a sigh of relief as a new taxi firm gives rides to furry friends. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening, you are joining us today on World News. The uproar in Lahore around Imran Khan's home does not seem to wear down. Scores of supporters of Imran Khan barricade his home today to protect him as the former Prime Minister waited to hear the ruling on whether security forces could launch an operation to arrest him for the failing of showing up in court. Ahead of the court decision, a tense calm prevailed in Khan's Lahore neighbourhood, which earlier this week was a scene of pitched battles between hundreds of supporters and security forces that had tried to force the former international cricketer to attend a hearing in a case in which he is accused of selling state gifts given to him while he was Prime Minister. Khan denies the charges. Even though there was no police presence on Friday, witnesses say Khan supporters armed with batons and iron rods remained stationed outside his home. The violence on Tuesday and Wednesday had raised fears of a new political standoff in the nuclear-armed Pakistan, which is already grappling with an economic crisis. Two provinces in southeastern Turkey were hit by heavy rainfall and flooding, leaving streets submerged and people trapped in flood waters. Devastated communities are left to clean up after the destruction again. Tonight, at least 14 people are dead and many more still missing after torrential flooding hit Turkey in the same area where devastating earthquakes struck just weeks before. Trucks washed off roads, highways collapsing in on themselves and people fighting for their lives against the raging currents. Rescue teams desperately searching for survivors after the flash flooding turned roads into rivers. Responders using ropes and ladders to pull people from rushing waters. These devastated communities left to clean up the destruction again. Just one month after massive earthquakes rocked the region. The situation has threatened their ability to recover, to be able to decide what their next steps are. Uh, we're seeing families who are right back at square one and trying to decide what to do next, where to go. Those catastrophic earthquakes killing over 44,000 people in the country and leaving thousands more injured and homeless. Now, families living in makeshift shelters after flooding submerged their homes. The Turkish communities, the people that I met when I was uh, responding directly and the responders I spoke to on the ground, it's absolutely incredible to see the resilience of people despite all of the things that they have faced so far. We are witnessing the true power of humanity. Many people already displaced by the quakes, forced to start over again after this latest natural disaster. Hours after the Swiss Central Bank said it was ready to provide financial support to Credit Suisse, the beleaguered mega bank took it up on the offer, hoping to reassure investors that it had the necessary cash to stay afloat. Credit Suisse said it would borrow up to $54 billion from the Swiss National Bank. Credit Suisse has taken a lifeline from the Swiss Central Bank in a bid to calm the concerns for its survival which had roiled global markets. It's borrowing up to $54 billion to shore up its finances and restore investor confidence. In a statement early Thursday, the bank said it had taken decisive action to preemptively strengthen liquidity. The move comes a day after shares in the lender collapsed. It's been battered by a string of scandals and has seen huge outflows of capital. That all came to a head this week amid wider investor concerns over the banking sector following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and other US lenders. Though the cases are unrelated, some see shared root causes. Gary Ung is senior economist at Natixis. 
So I feel this uh, event of SVB and also the Credit Suisse really reflect uh, what is happening in the financial sector is that uh, we start to see more after effect of the high interest rate. Of course, we cannot say the root causes of the two cases are the same because um, at the end of the day, the business models may be different. But they share the similarities that there are problems in the corporate governance. Concern over Credit Suisse far outweighed worries over SVB. It's a major global bank, meaning its collapse would be felt worldwide. Now, it's the first such lender to get an emergency lifeline since the 2008 global financial crisis. The move boosted shares early on in Europe. Credit Suisse stock jumped over 20%. The Eurostock's banking index was up around 2%. But concern over the banking sector has far from gone away, with lenders around the world assessing their own financial health. Investors remain on edge, waiting to see if another one is in trouble. As the United States and the Russian Federation inch closer and closer to nuclear conflict, it is China who, according to experts, act as a broker of peace. China has traditionally adhered to a principle of not interfering in other countries' conflicts, especially the more distant ones. But a peace deal struck in Beijing last week between Saudi Arabia and Iran highlights at China's aim to project itself as a responsible great power under Xi's stewardship. China is seemingly positioning itself as a mediator in the Russia-Ukraine war. Beijing has proposed a 12-point plan for peace in Ukraine, and China's foreign ministry has said it's in communication with both sides. All of this has sparked speculation that China may try to get the rivals to the negotiating table. Let's take a look at why the world power would try to mediate. The country typically doesn't get involved in other countries' conflicts, especially the more distant ones. But analyst Wang Jiangyu, a law professor at City University of Hong Kong, says that trying to broker peace is a low-cost venture that can yield high returns. So what does China propose as a route to peace? In its 12-point paper on the political resolution of the Ukraine crisis, Beijing urges both Russia and Ukraine to agree to a gradual de-escalation and ceasefire, while the plan calls for the protection of civilians and that the sovereignty of all countries be respected. China has refrained from condemning Russia for its invasion. The plan got lukewarm welcomes in both Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine says it will only consider peace settlements after Russian troops leave Ukrainian territory, though later said it was open to parts of the plan. Russia says it will take a nuanced study of the plan, but did not see any sign for a peaceful resolution for now. The US and NATO remain skeptical of China's proposals. NATO says China does not have much credibility as a mediator on Ukraine. So what role could China play, if any? Analysts say it will be hard for China to get Russia and Ukraine to negotiate at all. However, some suggest that President Xi Jinping could spark momentum towards talks. A fruitless attempt by NATO member Turkey to host dialogue in the weeks after the war began last year underscores the difficulty. But some analysts say China is in a better position than Turkey to mediate because it has more leverage over Russia. China does also have some influence over Ukraine, which would not want to ruin its chances of Chinese support for its eventual reconstruction. Whether China could be an honest broker is unclear. China's close ties with Russia mean its role will be viewed with deep skepticism. Days before Russia invaded Ukraine, China and Russia announced a no-limits partnership. And while China has called for peace since the beginning of the war, it's largely reflected Russia's position that NATO threatened Russia with its eastward expansion and Ukraine's Western allies fanned the flames of war by supplying it with tanks and missiles. The leaders of South Korea and Japan are to build ties that look toward the future based on security and economic cooperation. President Yoon suk yeol and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida declared various measures to achieve just that. The leaders of Japan and South Korea met on Thursday in a historic moment because it's the first time that a South Korean president has visited Japan in 12 years. The two countries 
both allies of the US but with centuries of animosity between them, are increasingly being driven closer together by China's growing presence in world affairs and mutual security threats such as North Korea. Underlining that subject, North Korea launched another long-range ballistic missile that landed in the sea between the three countries just hours before President Yoon Suk-yeol arrived in Japan. This video released by Japan's defense ministry is believed to show the missile's contrail. Yoon and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida hashed out several new agreements in the visit, including tightening intelligence sharing and ending an almost four-year dispute over raw materials used in high-tech equipment. The visit also came in the middle of joint military drills between South Korea and American forces. It's not clear if the warmth between the Japanese and South Korean governments will change opinions at home. A recent poll by Gallup Korea shows 64% of respondents there said there was no rush to improve ties with Tokyo without a change in Japan's attitude. We'll be back after a short commercial break with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Paris became a battleground as police tried to quell angry protesters after the French government pushed through an unpopular pensions bill without a vote. French Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne met boos and jeers and lawmakers holding signs of protest as she told the National Assembly that she would skip a vote on an unpopular pensions bill and force it through. The session was suspended for two minutes after left-wing lawmakers singing the national anthem prevented Bourne from speaking. And protesters gathered outside. But in the end, Bourne invoked Article 49.3 of the Constitution to raise the retirement age by two years to 64. The government says it's essential to ensure the pension system does not go bust. According to a source present at a last-minute meeting, President Emmanuel Macron told Bourne and others he had wanted to go for a vote, but considered the financial and economic risks of the bill being voted down too great. Here's Bourne announcing the move. Today on the Parliament bill, and due to the uncertainty hanging over a few votes, we cannot take the risk of seeing 175 hours of parliamentary debate collapse. We can't take the risk of seeing the compromise built by the two assemblies dismissed. We can't bet on the future of our pensions. This reform is necessary. Pushing the bill through after weeks of protests and fractious debate shows that Macron, a centrist, and his government failed to garner a majority in parliament. Far-right leader Marine Le Pen said Bourne should resign. There have been weeks of rolling strikes and massive protests in Paris and beyond, with trash piling up in the streets. Opinion polls show a vast majority of voters oppose the pension reform. Trade unions say there are other ways to balance the books, like taxing the wealthy more. Thursday's move is likely to add fuel to the fire, enraging unions, protesters and left-wing opposition parties who say the pension overhaul is unfair and unnecessary. Jerusalem walked to the site of a long red line painted by protesters along roads leading to Israel's Supreme Court hours after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected a compromise deal for his government's planned judicial overhaul. Protesters took to the streets of Tel Aviv as well. Protests across Israel Thursday after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected a compromise deal for his government's planned judicial overhaul. In Jerusalem, people in protective suits painted a long red line along roads leading to Israel's Supreme Court with the slogan, drawing the line in Hebrew, Arabic, and English. The hard right government's drive to limit Supreme Court powers while increasing its own power in selecting judges has caused alarm in Israel and abroad about the country's democratic checks and balances as protests have swelled for weeks. Renana Raz attended one near Tel Aviv University. We are here to protect our uh, democracy, our country, because we feel that our country is under a brutal attack of uh, the government, the Israeli government. 
Protesters called Thursday a day of resistance as they blocked roads and clashed with police. Women dressed in red cloaks and white bonnets in reference to the totalitarian novel-turned-TV series The Handmaid's Tale marched in formation. Israel's President Isaac Herzog had unveiled alternative changes to the judiciary Wednesday, but the Israeli cabinet secretary confirmed the government coalition was not behind the proposal. He warned that Israel was at a dangerous turning point. Whoever thinks that a true civil war where human life is at stake is a border we won't reach has no clue. Specifically now in the 75th year of the state of Israel, the abyss is at arm's reach. A civil war is a red line. I won't let that happen at any cost and in every way. Netanyahu visited Germany Thursday for a meeting with Chancellor Olaf Scholz, where he defended his judicial plan. But the ideas that are presented in Israel as though this is a break with democracy is not true. Israel was, Israel will remain a liberal democracy, not different and as strong and as vibrant as it was before and as Europe is today. Uh, We are not going to deviate from that one bit, uh, and we're committed to it. Netanyahu has been formally barred from involvement in the initiative because he's on trial on corruption charges, which he denied. Microsoft Corp trumpeted its latest plans to put artificial intelligence into the hands of more users, answering a spate of unveilings this week by its rival Google with updates to its own widely used office software. Microsoft chief executive said that the technology will unlock a new wave of productivity growth. We believe this next generation of AI will unlock a new wave of productivity growth. Microsoft on Thursday unveiled its latest plans to put artificial intelligence into the hands of more users by announcing upgrades to its widely used Office software. Coming as rival Google announced a flurry of its own upgrades earlier this week, touting AI features for Gmail and a magic wand to draft pros in its own word processor. Introducing Microsoft 365 Copilot, your Copilot for work. Copilot combines the power of large language models with your data in the Microsoft Graph and the Microsoft 365 apps to turn your words into the most powerful productivity tool on the planet. Microsoft previewed a new AI co-pilot for Microsoft 365. Its product suite that includes Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, and Outlook emails. The company, outpacing peers through investments in ChatGPT's creator OpenAI, also showcased a new business chat experience that can pull data and perform tasks across Microsoft's applications simply on a user's written command. Here, you're in a meeting with your team. You can ask Copilot to summarize what's happened so far. You can see who said what, what points were made. Copilot is really capturing the spirit of the discussion. As the meeting progresses, you can check on where people stand. You can even ask Copilot what questions are unresolved. The frenzy to invest in and build new products began with the launch last year of ChatGPT, the chatbot sensation that showed the public the potential of so-called large language models. Such technology learns from past data how to create content anew. This type of AI is evolving rapidly. Just this week, OpenAI began the release of a more powerful version known as GPT-4, which is included in the chatbot in Microsoft's updated Bing search engine. This week's drumbeat of news, including new funding for AI startup Adept, reflects how companies large and small are locked in a fierce competition to deploy software that could quickly reshape how people work. Every morning in a city in Indonesia's Far East, sleepy teenagers can be seen trudging zombie-like through the streets on their reluctant way to school. The pilot project in Kupang, the capital of East Nusa Dengara province, has 12th graders at 10 high schools starting classes at 5.30 a.m. Authorities say the scheme is intended to strengthen child's discipline. The sun is not yet up as these teenagers dutifully make their way to school. The headmaster is waiting for them at the entrance. The word Pancasila, Indonesia's state philosophy, flashes across an electronic billboard. It's 5.30 a.m. The pilot scheme in Kupang, announced last month, is intended to strengthen children's discipline. But it only applies to 12th graders in 10 high schools, giving teachers a headache. 
Teachers were not in favor of this policy because they must teach in three shifts. It means they start working at 5.30 a.m. and finish at 5 p.m. Parents say that instead of improving their minds and bodies, the extra early start to the day is simply leaving sleep-deprived teens exhausted. The policy has also drawn criticism from education experts as lacking scientific basis. Studies have shown that starting school before 8.30 increases health risks for teenagers and that compromise in their sleep quality could lead to anxiety and depression. Proponents of the plan argue that the pupils that start early also finish early and can get adequate sleep. Some adults in Kupan are also encouraged to get the day off to an earlier start, including at the local education agency. Their morning routine starting with a dance. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world. Hundreds of spectators watched as former Australian professional surfer Blake Johnston broke the world record for the longest surfing session in Sydney today. Britain and New Zealand said it would ban TikTok on government phones with immediate effect, a move that follows Western countries who have barred the Chinese-owned video app over security concerns. Poland will send Ukraine four MiG-29 fighter jets in the coming days, making it the first of Kyiv's allies to provide such aircrafts while the battle for Bakhmut rages on. At least eight people were killed after the roof of a potato cold storage building collapsed in northern India. The accident took place in Uttar Pradesh after which national and state emergency services were deployed to carry out search and rescue operations. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador told a news conference that it was not Mexico that was responsible for the introduction of most fentanyl into the United States, adding that more fentanyl reaches the United States and Canada directly than through Mexico. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with the owner of a pet taxi making for parents' lives easier in the busy metropolitan of Dubai as he shoppers around a special kind of clients. Thank you and good night. <laughs>